Before I introduce you, I just want to say a couple of things. One is I'm actually really thrilled we're doing this via Skype, though ask me in 70 minutes if that's still true based on the technology. Um, but I think this is the way to go. This is the future in terms of sharing information with each other without generating a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. So we're, we're thrilled, Tim, that you could be here in this way. Tim is an extremely accomplished scholar and is a perfect match for the themes that we know of at the Gund Institute uh, and, and here at UVM, more generally at the Rubenstein School. Um, he has a PhD from the University of Rochester in psychology. He's now at Knox College in, in Illinois, where he's the professor and chair of psychology. He's got an incredible publishing record. Here's three recent books, High Price of Materialism, MIT Press, co-editor of Psychology and Consumer Culture, 2004 from the APA, um, and a recent book from WWF in the UK, Meeting Environmental Challenges, The Role of Human Identity. Um, he's going to speak in an area that I think is so important, particularly I think this issue that came up in the honors class last Tuesday, identity, what that idea means and what it means in terms of being operative in this great challenging century we have. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks um, for having me here virtually. I'll be curious to how to see how this goes and everybody keep their fingers crossed that the um, technology continues working for us. And I wonder if instead of seeing myself, I could see where the slides are. I don't know if I'm going to cut out here. Yeah, that, that would probably be better for me and then I'll know where we where belong. So again, I'm Tim Kasser. I'm a psychology professor and I really approach the problems of environmental challenges as a psychologist. And Clearly, please advance uh, to the next slide. Clearly, there's quite a number of ecological crises that humans and other species on the Earth are facing here. We've got problems of carbon emissions that are leading to greenhouse gases and climate disruption. We have problems of pollution, which are killing other species. We have biodiversity loss. So there's a whole bundle of different ecological crises that we face. Next slide, please. Now, so far, my take on it, both as a psychologist and as a citizen, has been that there have been three main ways that uh, the community interested in the environment has tried to approach these challenges. One has been through a lot more scientific research. So we have more and more evidence coming out about climate disruption, about the problems of biodiversity loss, et cetera. Um, given that scientific research, there's been quite a number of environmentalists who've been very focused on getting people to adapt relatively simple behavior changes. So using compact fluorescent light bulbs or driving a hybrid car, these kinds of things. And then finally, there have been at least some policy revisions here and there. There's talk about cap and trade and things like that. Um, thus far, though, my sense is that the success of these has been somewhat limited. Next slide, please. It seems that a great deal of the scientific research that scientists have done has been met either with denial of the meaning of that research or relative apathy with regard to it. People either don't believe the research or they don't care. Um, we also, uh, the research shows that these simple kinds of behavior changes like recycling or compact, using the compact fluorescent generally are not spilling over into the larger lifestyle changes, which it's going to be ultimately necessary for people to take on if we're going to meet these environmental challenges. And then finally, even though there have been some important changes in policy, a lot of the policy, especially with regard to uh, carbon emissions and climate disruption in this nation, has really been tinkering around the edges. And when you ask politicians why that is, well, that's because they say, well, there's not much public demand for it. And when you take a look at the surveys, on the whole, public demand for energy changes and environment changes is low compared to other things. Furthermore, we have institutional resistance, both within the business community sometimes, as well as within the government. Next slide, please. Now, this is why Tom Crompton at the WWF UK and I, uh, have, and, and I have been working together to try to develop an additional approach to campaigning. Now, first off, I want to say we're not rejecting the idea that we should keep doing science. We still think behavior changes should happen. We still think we should be working at the policy level. And I think you'll see that's true. But what we argue is that thus far, environmentalists and those interested in conservation and the rest have been ignoring a really important additional component, which is human identity. Now, human identity is the way that we understand ourselves, who we think of ourselves as being, our self-concept, our ideas about ourselves, the story we tell about who we are. It's about our values and our goals and a whole different 
array of different things as we'll be seeing here momentarily. Now the reasons that we think that identity is an important thing for environmentalists to focus more on are the following, just in the abstract. The first is that when information comes in, next slide please, when information comes into a person, sometimes that information is just rejected depending on a person's identity. And that's what we're seeing in a lot of cases with regard to climate denial and apathy. People get all of this information, but they don't care, and it just bounces right off of them because of their identity. Next slide. On the other hand, sometimes uh, the, if you have a particular identity, then people do take in that information and it influences them. Next slide. Now, what that can influence them to do is two very important things. The first is to engage in particular kinds of ecological behaviors that are beneficial, and to engage in particular political actions, which also can put pressure in terms of the policy changes that we think we need. On the other hand, if we have a more ecologically damaging human identity, then that leads us to engage in ecological behaviors which are relatively damaging, and it leads us to engage in political actions that work against good environment, or that maybe you're just apathetic about it. So these are the reasons that we think it's really important to focus on human identity as we consider the ways to move forward with the environment, because it influences how we accept or not information, it influences the, beh the behaviors we engage in, and it influences how we want to support certain politics. Next slide, please. Now, in a book that Tom and I wrote this summer, that came out this summer, we wrote about three different aspects of human identity that the research suggests are very relevant to environmental outcomes. The, and this is mostly research that's done in social and personality psychology and in environmental psychology. The first aspect of identity that I'll just briefly mention here has to do with social identity. So one of the things that is true of humans is that part of our identity is made up of our social groups. So for example, I'm white, okay? So that's part of my identity. I'm male, that's part of my identity. I'm a professor, that's part of my identity. And so what ends up happening is we, when we meet other people who are like us, they are part of what's called the in-group. So other white people are part of my in-group, other males are part of my in-group, other professors are part of my in-group. Now what the research shows is that almost automatically, once you create an in-group, you create an out-group non-whites, non-males, non-professors. And what literally thousands of research studies show is that we tend to treat people who are in, in our in-groups in positive ways, and we tend to stereotype and denigrate and steal from other people who are in the out-groups. Now, one of the things that's true about the human identity is that it includes the identity of human. Okay? Part of how we think of ourselves is as humans. Now, that's the in-group. Other humans are in our in-group. Well, who's in the out-group then? Non-human nature. And this, I think, helps to explain some of the dynamics about why we uh, treat nature and other animals like we do. And that's one of the aspects of identity that we discuss in the book. Another aspect of identity we talk about in the book has to do with ways of coping with threat. So another thing that identities have to do is deal with threats to those identities or threats to the person. Um, and some ways of coping are more adaptive for the environment than others. So, for example, when people are in denial, which is a standard coping mechanism, um, they say, well, no, nothing's going on. That's uh, something which doesn't promote good environmental behavior. When they're apathetic, some psychodynamic people consider apathy actually to be a defense mechanism. Um, apathy, again, is not very good for the environment. Projection is another kind of coping strategy. So it's not my fault here in America. It's those Chinese people and those Indians who are um, building up their, uh, their, their economy and building a coal plant every week. It's their fault. Okay? That's projection. Instead of accepting our own responsibility, we project it onto others. And then hedonism, that's another coping mechanism. I'm not feeling very good, guess I'll go get blasted tonight. Okay? That's a way sometimes people cope, which again isn't good for the environment. So those are two of the aspects of identity that we wrote about. And the third one that I'm going to be talking about mostly today has to do with our values, what we think is important to us. And I'm going to be talking in particular about a set of values that's called the self-enhancing materialistic values and goals. Next slide, please. Now, what value research has done is tried to understand across various cultures 
what are the basic sets of values that people think are important? What across any culture can you find people identifying as a particular value, as something that at least some people say is very important, et cetera? And one of the sets of values that I'm going to show you in a minute that emerges consistently across all cultures which have been studied is what we'll call the self-enhancing materialistic values. Now, this has been shown in the work of Schwartz, as well as in the work uh, that I've done with Fred Bruse. Next slide, please. Now, this is Schwartz's circumplex. We'll be talking about this in more detail a little bit later on. But the two values that um, I want to focus on right now are the values for hierarchy and the values for mastery. And the reason I want to focus on these are these are the values, which we'll see in a minute, are the ones which tend to be associated with bad environmental outcomes. Next slide, please. Now, mastery values involve attempts to, to control the world, attempts to be in charge and be successful through one's actions, okay? And in most consumer capitalist countries, what being successful means is to own a lot and to consume a lot to make a lot of money, which of course has pretty important environmental outcomes. Another uh, problematic value that we see in Schwartz's work is the hierarchy value. The hierarchy value is the value that people have to care about power, to care about wealth, to care about social status. Again, lots of times what happens, as we'll see, is that those sort of values are associated with the kinds of behaviors that are pretty problematic for the environment. Next slide, please. Now, this is the um, value research that my colleagues and I have done. And in the red circle, you see a set of values which we call extrinsic values. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hello? Next slide, please. Can you not hear me? There we go. Okay, great. Now, we call these the extrinsic values because they're focused on external rewards and other people's opinions. And the three main extrinsic values are for financial success, for making a lot of money, having a lot of possessions, for popularity, which is trying to have to be admired by a lot of people and to have power and status and then image which is trying to have a particular look and of course the way that we look is almost always mediated through consumer products my car my house my clothes etc next slide please now what we know from a variety of different kinds of research is that the more that people focus on these values for hierarchy and for mastery and the more they focus on these extrinsic values for uh, money, image, and status, the worse their ecological attitudes are. For, so for example, Good did a study where she found that um, the more folks focused on materialistic values, the less positive were their ecological attitudes. Um, Saunders and Monroe did a study on the topic of biophilia, which is an E.O. Wilson concept of loving life. And by life, I don't mean my own life, I mean life all around me. Materialistic people have lower biophilia. And Schultz did a study that was a cross-cultural study in about six or seven different nations that showed that the more that people concern themselves with values like mastery and hierarchy, the less they cared about how the um, environmental damage would affect other humans, children, future generations, and non-human life. Next slide, please. We also know that these kinds of values are associated with problematic ecological behaviors. So for example, the more that people endorse materialistic values, the less likely they are to engage in ecological behaviors like um, you know, recycling or using both sides of the paper or walking when they can or turning off lights in um, unused rooms. And now we have another study that uh, Street Matthew and I did where we measured people's values. Uh, we had them write about their values actually and then we put them into a, uh, an experimental grocery store and we gave them the chance to either buy organic or non-organic food and to either take a bag or no bag to take that food home in. We found that the more people were writing about those power hierarchy values, the less organic food they bought and the less likely they were to skip the bag instead they used a plastic bag. So these values are influencing people's actual behavior as well. Next slide, please. We also know um, that these values are associated with people's ecological footprints. I'm sure most of the audience here is pretty familiar with this concept. 
but it's the number of acres that it takes in order to support your lifestyle. It's based mostly on your transportation choices, your food choices, and your housing choices. And Kirk Brown and I did a study where we found that the more people were focused on these materialistic values, the higher their ecological footprints. The more resources they were using in order to sustain their lifestyles, therefore the less that was available to them, uh, to, I'm sorry, that was available for other people and other species and future generations. Next slide, please. One second. Now, another thing we know is uh, you can see the same sort of thing playing out in resource dilemma games. Now, these are games that have been uh, invented by psychologists and economists and environmental scientists to try to um, act like the real world. Okay, And so in this game that I'm about to tell you about, what uh, Ken Sheldon did was he measured people's values before he brought them into the lab. And then he put them into groups of four people. Some of the groups were all four people with high materialistic values. Some of the groups, all four people, had low materialistic values. And some of the groups had too high and too low people. And then what he said is, OK, you four people are going to play a game together. And each of you is in charge of a timber company. OK, so you run a timber company that's going to uh, cut down some, some uh, trees in a state forest. And what you have to do is you have to make a bid to say, how many acres of land in the state forest are you going to cut down? Okay. Um, now, obviously, timber companies want to make a profit. So at some level, it's in your interest to cut down more. Now, what um, then they did was all four of the groups would, all four of the people in a group would make a bid. And then they'd say, OK, well, together, this much has been bid. They would cut down that much of the forest. Then they would add in 10% for regrowth. And then they would do it a second year. Okay, Everybody would bid a second time. They would uh, take out whatever everybody bid, add in 10% for a regrowth, then do it a third year, and a fourth year, and a fifth year, et cetera, um, until either 25 years had passed or there was no forest left. And what they found, next slide, please, what they found was if you take a look at that black, solid black line, the high materialistic groups um, started, to, uh, started at a higher, significantly higher level of first bid. They were cutting down more of the forest. And they stayed that way for a good 10 years. And then you see what happened was there was a collapse. And the reason for the collapse was not because they were cutting back and saying, oh, we shouldn't be doing this. It's because they had used up most of their forest. There wasn't much left. And you can see by the end, they were cutting down significantly less um, harvest every year. And that's because actually it was the case that most of the materialistic groups didn't even have a forest left at 25 years. The low materialist groups, in contrast, were significantly more likely to still have a forest 25 years later. Excuse my phone there. Um, next slide, please. Now, the final kind of research that I want to tell you about with regard to materialistic values has to do with some cross-cultural work that I've been doing. Um, so I've been interested in, well, what's happening at a national level or at an international level? And so what I was able to do was to obtain from 20 different wealthy nations um, value measures that assessed the mastery and the hierarchy values that citizens in those nations um, endorsed. So some nations, the citizens place a big high emphasis on mastery and hierarchy, and other nations, it's lower. And then what I did was I correlated that with information about the CO2 emissions for that nation and also for the ecological footprints of that nation. Next slide, please. And what we found was after you controlled for GDP per capita, um, that the more that nations valued hierarchy and mastery, those self-enhancing materialistic values, the higher their carbon emissions. Now, again, this isn't just due to economic activity because we partialed out economic activity with GDP per capita, okay, on average. We find similar effects for ecological footprints of nations, although they're, they're definitely weaker, but on my end, it's also quite small. So what I hope that you've seen by now, next slide, please, what I hope that you've seen by now is that there's a problem with these self-enhancing materialistic values, this aspect of identity, um, if we're concerned about ecological outcomes. And so a lot of my thinking over the last few years has been designed to try to understand, well, if materialistic values are the problem here, well, how should we um, set about trying to um, do good things for the environment uh, as a way to um, and, and if do that by affecting people's materialistic values? And fundamentally here, what I have is a twofold strategy um, that I'm going to tell you about next. The first is that what you have to do is you have to identify the causes of materialism and eliminate them. 
Okay, get rid of the causes of materialism. The second thing you have to do is you have to find out what the healthy values are and encourage the healthy values so that they become more important to people and materialistic values become less important to them. So let me walk you through that next, please. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so there are three main causes of materialistic values that the research has identified. I'm going to go through this very quickly and not tell you about them all. Uh, social modeling, insecurity, and consumer capitalism. Next slide, please. Social modeling is pretty obvious, and the idea here is that the more that you receive messages in your social environment that suggest that it's really important to uh, care about money and possessions and power, the more like you yourself are also to care about those things. So, for example, we know that when you have parents and peers who are more materialistic, you are too. We know that going to business school and law school, where you're exposed to a lot of materialistic messages in the readings and in the lectures, and sometimes from your peers, also influences and increases materialistic values. And of course, watching television, that's where you get all kinds of different materialistic values. And there's some research showing that ingestion of other kinds of media, like the internet, where there's a lot of commercials, also increases materialistic values. Next slide, please. Um, probably more uh, subtly, what we also know is that psychological insecurity seems to lead to more materialism. That is, when people are feeling threatened or when people are feeling psychologically insecure, one of the things they seem to do is to orient towards materialistic values. So we know from the research, for example, that having cold and controlling parents makes you more materialistic. We know that when people feel rejected by their peers, which can make you feel pretty insecure, those individuals end up more materialistic. Uh, economic insecurity can also lead to more materialism as well and, and these kinds of values. Next slide. Now, some people would say that the big insecurity is death, and indeed, uh, there are experimental studies that show that thinking about your own death can increase materialistic values, um, can also increase your consumption desires, and can also make you more greedy in those kind of forest dilemma studies that I just told you about. Next slide, please. Um, what this study did was to randomly assign people to either write short essays about their own death or about music, and then ask them to play that same forest dilemma game that I described a little bit earlier. And this is how many acres people bid to harvest on their first bid. And what you can see is that people who had just been thinking about their own death had their insecurities raised. They bid over 60 acres. People in the control condition were bidding significantly less at um, less than 50 acres. Next slide, please. Now, another very important aspect of our world that influences how materialistic we are is the economic system that we live in. Um, I don't have time to get into this in much detail, but one of the things we know is that in order for our particular American, uh, our particular economic system, American corporate capitalism to survive, it needs people to believe that money and power and status and possessions are important. Because think what happens if everybody says, oh, no, that stuff's not important, then they don't go out and work a whole lot of hours, they don't go shopping at the mall and consume, and we don't end up with all of the economic activity on which our, um, our society depends. So just like a religion needs people to believe certain things if it's going to survive, an economy needs people to value and believe certain things if it's going to survive. And the kind of values that um, American corporate capitalism needs are the materialistic values. Um, we proposed this in a paper we wrote about capitalism a couple of years ago, and Shalom Schwartz, who's the same guy who did that value work, um, tested this idea. Next slide, please. And he tested this by looking at different kinds of capitalism. Um, just like there's different kinds of Christianity, there's Presbyterians, and there's Catholics, and there's Roman, uh, there's the Greek Orthodox, they're all Christian. There's different kinds of capitalism, too. And uh, Schwartz used some work by Holland Gingrich, which showed that some nations have a liberal market economy, where when there's a problem, what they do is they set businesses in competition with each other and workers in competition with everybody, and they take the government out, and they say, okay, let the free market solve it. Two of the most um, liberal-oriented nations, according to Holland Gingrich, are the United States and the United Kingdom. Next slide, please. In contrast, some economies focus on coordinated markets, and so when there's an economic or a social problem, what they do is they pursue strategic solutions. They bring together um, corporations and governments and businesses and workers to try to co cooperate together instead of compete in order to solve problems. And Holland Gingrich say Germany and Austria 
are typical of these kinds of nations. Next slide, please. What Schwartz found was that the more a nation was oriented towards cooperative capitalism, the less it cared about hierarchy and the less it cared about mastery. To say it the other way, the more that a nation cared about um, competitive capitalism, liberal capitalism, the more it cared about hierarchy and the more it cared about mastery. Next slide, please. Here's a scatter plot that shows that, and I, what you see is that, or that dot with the United States. We were the most competitive nation, and we're also the nation that cares most about hierarchy values. And hierarchy values are the values which the research shows are bad for the environment. Okay, And this might help explain why it is that we haven't done a whole lot in order to improve our environmental standing as a nation. The people are oriented towards hierarchy values. Why? That's what the economy requires. Next slide, please. Now, so I've told you a little bit about the causes of materialism, and now I want to tell you some about the healthy values. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that psychologists know about values is that no value sort of stands alone in a person's mind. Values are part of a larger value system, okay? They're part of a, a larger array of different things that one might care about. The way that I like to think about it is that there's sort of like there's a pie, okay? And everybody has a slice of that pie, okay? And you've got your hedonism slice, and you've got your spirituality slice, and you've got your caring about your family slice, and you've got your um, engaging in the community slice. Now, what we can do is through a variety of different measures, we can determine how big each of those slices is to somebody, okay? So you might have a little wedge you know, just a little sliver of spirituality, but somebody else might have a big old piece of spirituality. Now, one of the things we know, too, is that values, some values, can be psychologically consistent with each other. That is, when I care about one value, I also tend to care about this other value. Other values stand in psychological conflict with each other. The more I care about this value, the less I'm going to care about this value, and vice versa. Next slide, please. Now here's Schwartz's hierarchy again, um, I'm sorry, his circumplex again, that, that assesses how people's values are organized in their mind. And what you see there with those red arrows is that hierarchy and mastery are right next to each other. Now this isn't just something Schwartz made up. This is based on data collected from thousands and thousands of people across dozens of nations, okay? And what it means is that the more people care about hierarchy, the more they care about mastery. Now, that makes sense, right? If you're going to strive to try to be successful and do everything I want to do, you're also going to generally, at least in most cultures, care about power and status hierarchies because that striving puts you up and up in the hierarchy. Now, take a look, though, at those values that the green arrows are um, pointing towards. Now, what you notice is that these values are on the opposite side of the circumplex um, with egalitarianism, especially across from hierarchy, and harmony across from mastery. What this means is that psychologically, it's quite difficult to simultaneously pursue hierarchy and mastery on the one hand and harmony and egalitarianism on the other. Next slide, please. Now, harmony values are about fitting into the natural and social world, prioritizing peace, and also protecting the environment. That's one of the basic values involved there. Egalitarianism is about accepting others and cooperating protecting uh, and promoting social justice and equality, which of course are also environmental issues in many respects, especially when you think about poor people who are going to bear the brunt of some climate disruption and other species who are also bearing the brunt of that. Next slide, please. Now here's uh, the circumplex Fred Gruze and I developed. What you can see there in the red circle is that um, popularity, image, and financial success are all right next to each other. Makes sense. The more you care about image, the more you care about popularity. you got to get some money so you can have the right image, etc. It's all of a piece. Now look at the values that stand on the opposite side of the circle there. Next slide, please. These are what we call the intrinsic values. Now the reason we call these the intrinsic values is because they're inherently satisfying to pursue. Um, they, they tend to be matching with people's psychological needs. Um, the three main intrinsic values that we've studied are self-acceptance, which is the desire to grow and to be who I really am. Affiliation, which is to have close relationships with each other, um, especially with family and friends. And community feeling, which is the desire to make the broader world a better place. So what we see with this Gruze model is something quite similar to what we found with Schwartz, is that the more you're focused on the materialistic values, those extrinsic values of popularity, image, and 
um, financial success, the less you're focused on values that have to do with benefiting the whole world. Next slide, please. It's also really important to note that the research shows that the more people are focused on values like um, egalitarianism and harmony and community feeling, the more they engage in environmentally friendly behaviors, the lower their ecological footprints, and the less they consume in forest dilemma games, like the ones that I've been telling you about. Next slide, please. So what Tom and I basically wrote in our book is that, okay, if we accept what I've just told you, if we accept that the materialistic, the research on materialistic values and self-enhancing values, which are part of our identities, are associated with um, unfortunate ecological and environmental outcomes, then it probably behooves the environmental movement to not just focus on creating more and more research and not just focus on simple behavior changes and not just focus on policy, but also to focus on the aspects of human identity which are leading to some of these problematic outcomes. Okay, That it's another sort of strategy that the environmental movement can engage in. And so what we suggested in the book was that it's important for uh, environmentalists to start developing some campaigns to diminish the causes of those self-enhancing materialistic values and to develop some campaigns to promote intrinsic values as well. Now, some of these campaigns on the surface of them are not going to look like environmental campaigns. Okay, But if you take an identity approach, which is what we're encouraging here, if you think about well, what's the underlying feature of identity which environmentalists need to change if we're going to have good environmental outcomes, I think you'll see that ultimately these are environmental campaigns as well as campaigns for other kinds of things. Now, I'm just going to walk you through a few of them quite quickly here so that we have some time for questions, um, uh, just to give you a taste of, of the kinds of th things that we've written about. Next slide. So what you see over there is a report card envelope that children in Seminole County, Florida brought home with their report cards inside of them. And I think what you can see, hopefully, is Ronald McDonald down there in the corner. And the reason he's there is right above that, it says that if the child received all A's, B's, and, or all A's and B's had good citizenship or had a good attendance, they could bring this report card envelope into McDonald's and get a free Happy Meal. Okay. Now this is just, I just show this as one of a bazillion examples which I could show about how advertising has gotten into people's lives. Now of course advertising is designed to promote consumerism. Underlying every single message in, in advertising is, is one fundamental message. Buy something and your life will be better. Okay. All that does is to enhance materialistic values. Okay. It's an encouraging of those materialistic self-enhancing values. We also know from a lot of research and consumer research in the marketing literature that advertisements usually make people feel insecure. And remember that psychological insecurity is one of the causes of materialism. So think about the ad, okay? You know, you're walking along, you don't smell very good, you're kind of ugly and you don't own a good car. And then you see somebody who's beautiful and smells good and has a nice car and they've got somebody of the opposite sex who's beautiful around them, okay? The basic message is, you're no good like you are. What you need to do is to buy this product and then you'll be better. So it makes people feel psychologically insecure and then it provides the solution, go buy something. The presence of these ads everywhere also suggests the social norm on the consumerism is good. You know, when you can see 5,000 commercial impressions a day on everything from report card envelopes to people's foreheads, etc., what you get is this message that, oh yeah, consumerism is a good thing. It must be a good thing because it is everywhere. Next slide. Now, um, if we accept this idea that advertising and material advertising is one of the social models that uh, influences materialistic values, and those are bad for the environment, then um, an actual identity campaigning kind of strategy is to work against advertising. So, for example, removing advertisements from public places is one of the things we suggest, because then it's less likely that those ads will activate the materialistic ideas in my mind. Okay. And also we get rid of this social message saying that advertising is so good we should plaster it everywhere. Um, another thing that we could do and that some nations have done is to ban advertising to children. You know, children's identities are right in the process of formation and marketers know this. And their goal 
is to make sure that kids think of themselves as consumers because then they can get money from them then and they've got them lifelong hooked into this sort of value system. Um, some nations have tried to be in advertising to children and have succeeded. Others, like our own, uh, actually discussed it, but it got um, blown away in the 1970s here in the U.S. But it is something that could be discussed and that other nations have done. The last thing I'll mention on this uh, effect is that you may not be aware of this, but right now all money that a nation or that a corporation spends on advertising is actually a tax write-off. Okay, so the billions of dollars, the hundreds of billions of dollars that are spent every year in the pursuit of trying to get people to consume and that therefore enhance materialistic values are actually a tax write-off, no revenue at all. Imagine that we tax those at about 10%, okay? We'd be talking about billions and billions of dollars in revenue that could be put into promoting intrinsic values, that could be put into our school system, that could be put um, also into positive environmental programs. Next slide, please. Another kind of thing that Tom and I write about is the idea of voluntary simplicity. Um, let me first differentiate voluntary simplicity from the involuntarily simple. The involuntarily simple are people who are poverty stricken. Okay? These are people who live materially simple lives but not out of choice. But there's a movement, and there always has been a movement in America, towards people rejecting the consumer idea, the capitalism idea, the idea that I have to work and work and work so that I can spend a lot, but then I spent too much, so I went into debt, so now i got to go work some more, okay, so I can spend even more. That's sort of the standard American lifestyle. Voluntary simplicity says, no, that's not the way that um, we're going to live our lives. Instead, as Dwayne Elgin writes, we want to focus on inward riches. We want to focus on the riches of personal growth and our family and um, contributing to our community and the environment, actually. Now, when I first heard about voluntary simplicity, I thought to myself, well, that sounds just like intrinsic values, okay? Those are the intrinsic values. And so Kirk Brown and I did a study, next slide, please, where we studied uh, 200 self-identified voluntary simplifiers, and we compared them with 200 mainstream Americans. And we found several very important things. First, if you take a look at that bottom arrow there, we found that the voluntary simplifiers were living at uh, more sustainable rates. Okay? They had lower ecological footprints. They were engaging in more positive environmental behaviors. We also found, very interestingly, that they were happier than the mainstream Americans, that they were living in a way which actually did a better job of satisfying their needs. Next slide, please. And the reason for this um, was that they were pursuing intrinsic values more than those uh, materialistic extrinsic values. The research showed that as well. That is, compared to the mainstreamers, the voluntary simplifiers were much more oriented towards self-acceptance and affiliation and community, and much less oriented towards money image and popularity. This completely accounted for why they were happier, and it also helped account for why they were living in a more sustainable way. Next slide, please. So I'd like to suggest that voluntary simplicity um, is an idea which is, uh, which is something that environmentalists could be focusing on here as a broader lifestyle change because it's the kind of thing that is going to promote the sorts of values that promote not only um, living in a more sustainable way but also being happier. And there's a variety of different ways that we could set about doing this. Um, I just want to mention two books. Uh, your Money or Your Life, which is sort of a self-help book for becoming um, a more simple, having a more simple life. And then Simplicity Circles, which are more or less support groups for people who are trying to live in a more simple way. Next slide, please. Now, another thing that I want to mention um, that Tom and I write about are national indicators of progress. So right now, most of the ways that we decide whether or not our nation is doing well has to do with our gross domestic product. But the problem with gross domestic product, as you've probably heard about here, is that it's primarily made up of materialistic values. Okay? So it's actually better for the environment if after this, or better for the economy, excuse me, it's better for the economy if after this talk I go get drunk and then I get in a car and I drive the car around my town and I get in a car accident than if I just go for a walk in the park. If I go for a walk in the park, I've contributed nothing to the economy. But if I go get drunk, I bought some beer, and if I get in my car, I've used some gasoline that I had to buy, and if I get in a car accident and I hit somebody, then they have to go to the hospital, which creates more economic activity, and my car has to get fixed, which creates economic activity too. 
Now, this is ludicrous when you think about it, that this is our measure of whether or not our nation is doing well. There's also environmental uh, examples, too, that you can use. If a company pollutes in order to make profit, well, the, con the economy went up. And then if they have to pay somebody to clean up the lake, then um, the economy went up because they had to pay the environmental engineer, too. It's all good for economic growth. Now, there's a variety of different um, approaches that are out there which say, no, this is ludicrous. Let's figure out a better way to measure national progress. And I've listed some of the ideas up there. Probably the most famous one is the genuine progress indicator. Next slide, please. Now, what this slide shows is uh, down there along the bottom, you have year uh, from 1950 till 2000, and then you have um, GDP or GPI per capita um, along the vertical axis. And what you can see is that even though GDP has about tripled, we're about three times as wealthy uh, in 2000 as we were in 1950 here in the United States, genuine progress has remained flat. And what the genuine progress indicator does is it takes out all of those negative aspects of economic growth that are bad for the environment or bad for people's well-being, bad for social cohesion, et cetera. And it says, no, that's not genuine progress. We're not going to count that. Okay. And then it puts in other things which are good for people's well-being in the environment, like volunteering or um, a lot of women's work, which isn't counted into the GDP, a lot of work that women do, um, like taking care of other people, um, that isn't part of GDP. And what you can see here is that when you recalculate on that basis, you find that our nation isn't doing nearly as well as that economic indicator might suggest. Next slide. And so a lot of people have suggested that if you would change to these different kinds of indicators, citizens would start to recognize that um, GDP hasn't actually improved the quality of their life. We'd also be getting some new social norms. I'd like everybody in the audience to imagine for a second that um, the many hundred of times a day when you hear something about how the GDP is doing or how consumer confidence is doing or how the Dow Jones is doing, now I'd like you to imagine that you get that replaced with how volunteer work is doing this week and how um, happy people are this week and how many birds have gone extinct this week and what carbon emissions have been this week. Imagine that we got all of that information, which is included in the GPI, just as much as we got all of this financial information. Okay, what people would start to think is, well, maybe that stuff's important. Maybe I should be caring about that. Wait, what are my politicians doing um, for that? Okay, and it would start to change people's identities and values, perhaps in some important ways. Next slide, please. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about here that we suggest in the identity campaigning book is not only do we need to develop new campaigns uh, around these other issues, but environmentalists need to be aware of iatrogenic effects. Now, what an iatrogenic effect? It's a medical term that's in psychology, too. And the idea is when you have an iatrogenic effect, what you've done is the treatment actually makes the illness worse. Okay, so if I'm a doctor and you come to me and you with a problem and I give you a pill and the pill actually makes your problem worse, that's what's called an iatrogenic effect. Now, I'd like to suggest that some of the things that the environmental movement is doing right now may actually be iatrogenic. Next slide, please. The reason for this is that sometimes a lot of uh, marketers that environmental organizations work with take those same ideas that they've learned from their work trying to sell Coca-Cola and Nike and implant it into the environmental movement and say, okay, well, we have to assume people are basically self-interested and that's what we want to appeal to, okay? We want to appeal to financial values. Now, think what that means. What that means is that every time that an environmental organization appeals to a person's self-interest or appeals to financial values, what they've done is they've become another social model which has said that what you should prioritize is money and your own self-interest. Okay? They've become, in some ways, just like the parent or the peer who says that this is important. Now, if we know that those social models about materialism lead people to care more about materialism and that's bad for the environment, perhaps that's working against us. I would similarly say that to the extent that the environmental movement continually relies upon making the business case for sustainability or making the case for green consumption, what you end up with is the possibility, again, of encouraging these materialistic values. Okay, you've encouraged them, you've put them out there, you've said, hey, the reason to do this um, is to, because it'll be good for business. 
What's going to happen when it's not so good for business? Okay, what's going to happen with an environmental issue that's not good for business? Or when those values are in conflict? Or doesn't this perhaps increase the likelihood that people are ultimately saying, yeah, I guess money is most important. They're saying only do this if it's good for my business too. Green consumption too. To me, it's, it's awfully silly to think that the way to solve the problem that we're currently in is through doing more of what got us into this problem. Okay? I agree that we need to consume in a very different way, but to focus primarily on that just ends up reinforcing consumerism. Um, in the interest of time, I'm actually going to slip uh, slide through the next few slides which would support that. So let's just go ahead and advance here. Um, just keep going, keep going. Uh, stop there for a second. Um, here's just where, uh, I, no, one back, go one more, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, what I want to have you do here is return to this circumplex. So remember the values which are on opposite sides of the um, circumplex are ones which are in psychological conflict with each other. So um, remember also that a circle has 360 degrees. So perfect opposition is reflected in 180 degree opposition. Now what we found in this study was that financial success, caring about materialism and consumerism, is 192 degrees opposed to community values, caring about helping the broader world, the values which benefit the environment. So basically, again, every time the environmentalist is talking about green consumption and self-interest and the business case for sustainability, you're activating those financial success values. And what's that going to do? And the research shows this, work by Greg Mao shows this, it ends up suppressing the values on the other side of the circumplex. Those are the very values that environmentalists need if they're going to make progress on the kinds of things we care about. Next slide, please. One more. Okay, so just to summarize, um, what I've tried to show you here today is that um, one aspect of identity, which is the values that we care about and the materialistic values that we have, are associated with unfortunate ecological outcomes. Um, I've demonstrated to you that we know some things about what causes those materialistic values, and we know some things about what the alternatives are to those values that are problematic for the environment. Obviously, today, I haven't had time to talk about these other uh, aspects of identity, uh, group identity and in-group, out-group, and I haven't had time to talk about um, the kinds of coping strategies that people use. But in our book, we make basically the same kinds of arguments. We lay out the research that shows why certain group identities and why certain coping strategies are bad for the environment. And then we say, okay, well, what can environmentalists do about that if they're going to work at the level of identity? And what we suggest, um, as I've just shown you, is that if environmentalists are interested in making progress, we believe that they can't just focus on behavior or research and policy. They need to address identity through their campaigns, and they need to be thinking a little bit more about whether the messages that they're putting out there into the world actually may be having um, negative effects that they're not expecting, and so start to change their messages in a way that kind of perhaps can actually activate the kinds of aspects of identity which are good for the environment. Next slide, please. So um, if you're interested in the uh, book, you can actually download a copy for free, um, and you can get pretty much all of the references that I mentioned today uh, in that book. And if you're interested in contacting me, uh, feel free to do so at that email. And that's all I have for you so that we have some time for questions. Thank you.